The Codpast. Hello and welcome to The Codpast. I'm your host, Sean Douglas, and this is the place where you'll hear right brain stories from interesting individuals. Today's guest was abandoned by her parents when they failed to sell her to the circus and has the strange peculiarity of being able to create fire with her bare hands. This could be a very interesting show. Today's guest is movie actress Lauren McCrosty. Welcome to the show, Lauren. Hello. So I, I should just clarify that you weren't actually abandoned by your parents and you don't actually have the ability to uh, make fire with your bare hands, but your character in the new Tim Burton film does. Yes, she does. As you were saying, I was a bit like, um, I th- you think you've got the wrong person. <laughs> um, yeah, I play Olive um, in Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children. And so the way that we learned about your role in this new film was um, you were with BAFTA doing an interview. Yeah. And as part of the interview, you just said, oh, you know, you had to read some questions. And you said, oh, oh I'm dyslexic. And do my I friend, get, yeah, yeah. do you get extra time? Time. Yeah, <laughs> and my friend who was on the crew, he was like, like texting me, said, "Oh my god, this girl's dyslexic, and she's nearly in this new Tim Burton film. You should get her on the show." I mean, was it quite interesting to have such a enthusiastic reaction to the fact that you were dyslexic? Yeah, I think so. Usually, when I say I'm dyslexic, people are either like over mothering or like just mm. completely abandoning the idea um, and trying not to think about yeah. it because it's such a problem so it was really good to have that kind of reaction and think about it like that but um, yeah it was nice to have that kind of reaction um, I just wonder how much of a problem it is for you because it was a bit of a joke when you said oh I'm, I'm dyslexic can I have more time but as an actress I mean mm. I, I see the the size of some of the scripts you guys get yeah. and that would scare the hell out of me because I assume you have to read it quite a few times mm-hmm. to get the gist of the story and to learn about your character and then you have to le- you know read through it over and over and over again to learn your lines and I don't think I've ever read one book more than once so I don't know <laughs> how you do that well um reading isn't so much a problem once I'm into the book then it's so it's much easier for me to process it because it, I'm just in that mindset but it's reading instructions is what kind of confuses me or stints me so questions in an exam paper you're asked to do certain things, you're asked to answer a certain question in a certain way, and my processing of that is what I find difficult. I guess in the Tim Burton film, you know, you've got to then take what's on the script and what's in the script, Mm -hmm. and then create something which is 3D out of it, which dyslexics are meant to be great at 3D perspective and stuff like that. Yeah, I really enjoy being able to kind of take words off a page, so to speak, and creating my own world and creating images and I like being able to take information from a script, so a character's expression or a character's line, and then being able to put my own spin and interpretation onto it because it's allowing allowing me to be dyslexic in a Mm. way because it's allowing me to interpret it in a way which I choose to. Tim Burton is is dyslexic. Oh, is he dyslexic? Yeah, and so um, he said that once when somebody had like a startled slight reaction to the way that he was explaining and um, he said yeah I'm dyslexic and I was like oh I am too Tim oh what did he say that on set yeah I was like yeah same Tim same (laughs) we're the same and so did I mean did you notice that then so so the way that he directed from Mm -hmm. other directors that you'd worked with did you notice a difference he's very visual Um, I think all directors have different approaches but his was very visual and it was very easy to kind of digest for an actor who are usually very creative Mm. anyway. So it's always really, really helpful to have a visual kind of image Mm. to go by. Um, But especially for a dyslexic actor, Mm. (laughs) it was like the perfect thing for me. So can you give me an example of how another maybe non-dyslexic director would explain for you to do something and how Tim would? Um, So, for example, a a non-dyslexic director may say, okay, can you just say this line a bit, louder say it as if you're a bit angrier really stern really really stern you know be really angry you're really angry at this person and then a dyslexic director may say something like okay imagine if you're really angry like you know when you you know in the film um xyz when this character is really really angry really really angry like be his level of angry and it was like oh yeah i've watched that film that's exactly okay okay i know exactly what he wants i know exactly the kind of mood because i've seen it before or it's like he explains it like um you know when you stumble your words and you get really annoyed at yourself it's like that kind of frustration it's Mm. not like when you fall over and you're like oh I tripped it's it's not that kind of frustration it's that this kind of frustration it's 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 giving another um platform to access 
um, mm. a certain type of emotion or experience. So I guess it's like other directors would give you pure information, whereas yeah. he'd be actually engaging all of your senses to, to create that. Yeah, but then saying that just um, directors are all very most of the time are all very creative. Mm. And so they do allow you to do that. And I, I think it is important to work with directors who, who don't give you that visual stimulus. Not everybody has it. Mm. And so you kind of have to be able to acclimatise to other people. You were diagnosed with dyslexia at sixth form. So it was only just before you got that big role. And it's quite interesting because different people have different reactions to finding out they're dyslexic. Some people are really angry. Mm -hmm. They think I could have done so much better. Why did I have to struggle? And others kind of go, oh, that's a great relief because now I don't feel stupid. Well, when I found out I was dyslexic, I was a bit shocked. I was like, well, if I'm dyslexic, then why didn't I get picked up earlier? I can't be dyslexic. And I was kind of angry at myself for, for even potentially allowing that to act as an excuse for perhaps bad performance you know I don't want to say that but um I don't I didn't want to use it like it, it's okay um that I did bad in that test because I'm dyslexic and I didn't get extra time on that which meant that it was unfair which meant that if I did get extra time because I'm dyslexic then it would I would have got the right exam like Mark um and I didn't want that to happen to me and I was angry that I was allowing myself to think that was a possibility if that makes sense mm. so um I had a mix of emotions, but I felt a bit relieved because it kind of made a bit more sense and it kind of explained a lot of my uh, behaviours as a as a student because I was very, um, what's the word, army cadet-like. I was... <laughs> military. It, military, that's the word. I was very military, a ruthless approach to homework. Like, it had to be done. Like, my friends would think I was such a freak. Everyone in my year thought I was, like, the nerdiest person because I was like, I have to do my homework, it's fine. I have to do th everything perfect. Because I was so, so forcing myself to be academic, it didn't always show that I was dyslexic because I would just push myself to being at a level which was normal or a b slightly above normal and so I guess I I can't blame my teachers for not being for not spotting it um mm. but you did say to me there were a few teachers that set, looked at yeah. your performance in oral stuff and then contrasted that to your written work and they said yes. oh, maybe you're dyslexic but it wasn't put any further yeah there. it was kind of like a question I think it was maybe to try and make me feel better and so I mean even though you had some issues uh processing and and stuff you, you'd done but doing quite well. I mean, you were at sixth form doing mm -hmm. psychology, history, drama and English. So basically yeah. everything that has loads of essays. To write. Yeah, everybody thinks that drama is really practical. And it is because it's a practical subject. But it um, it is 50-50. So you're doing as much practical as you are theory. And I actually, there was, um, I think I wrote in the drama exam, I wrote over, thir over th 25 pages oh my in, in my exam. And... I still have bruises on my hands. I'm, I'm not joking. My hands still hurt. And that was almost <laughs> two years ago. But that was one that. of your things though, wasn't it? Because you found it difficult to process information yeah. and remember stuff. So you just write everything yeah, down. Yeah, just regurgitate everything. And but was that helpful though? Because you said you just spend your lessons writing everything down. Yeah. And then was that useful for revision? No, no. <laughs> it was basically like... I'd panic, I'd stress, and I'd just be like, okay, I need to absorb everything in this situation. And I'd the teacher would say, you know, things, and they'd have their presentation, and I'd just write everything down. And all of these other students were looking at me as if I was some freak who was just possessed like the exorcist, I think. <laughs> and this military girl who's just obsessed with doing work. But really, it was just because I wanted to do well, and I just mm. didn't know how to approach do it, how to, how to do that. And this was the only way that I felt like I could cover everything because I was absorbing, I was trying to record everything. And when I wrote it all down, I didn't understand any of it because I hadn't process it mm. I hadn't learned it I'd just written down yeah. what somebody had just said yeah. and you don't learn that way you learn through somebody telling you something and you processing and understanding it and then writing it in in, in your the way own, that you think yeah, yeah in your own words in your own way and that may be a mind map but I was too scared to do a mind map because what happens if I miss something what happens if I don't understand it when I look back because if I because if I've got everything on my piece of paper, then I know that I can't have missed anything, mm. which means that if I learn everything on that piece of paper, then I'll know everything. But I wouldn't know it because I'd learnt it, so I would have known the words, but I wouldn't have known the information. And I think that's something that 
um, I found really difficult. I never understood how to interpret it. I never felt confident enough to to interpret what I'd learned in lessons and um, put it in my own words. I was so scared that I was going to miss some information out and then not have it in my exam paper and then be classified as stupid because I didn't know the information. Whereas if I wrote down everything, then I couldn't be told that I didn't know the information. I just couldn't read properly. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I could be told um, because I didn't I didn't apply the information. Mm. So how long have you been acting? How did you first get into it? Um, I've been acting for a long time. <laughs> Um, I used to put on little shows with my sister when I was very, very young to do l little dances and shows. So I guess I've always been wanted to perform and create. But um, professionally acting, I guess since 2013, the end of 2013, kind of had a strong interest in acting since I was probably about nine years old. Do you think acting gave you a place to be yourself? Because it seems like at school you were kind of fighting against, I want to be like this, but I, I think a little bit like this and mm. I'm a bit scared of this. But acting, it was just like, well, I can be it, me through other people in a way. It was, it kind of just allowed me to, to both improvise and not have any words to worry about and just let my brain kind of work and it was I mean it is still so much fun you can just create whatever you want to whatever you want to however any situation you can impersonate people you can um you can create a piece of um a theater you can recreate a piece of theater it's it's so much fun there's there's no end to it and um that's what I really enjoyed and because it was it wasn't academic, it was almost safer because it was like somebody's wrong is somebody's right most of the time. So it's it's controversial and it, it, it raises lots of different reactions and that's what I like. Um, but then it also combined beautiful literature and words, really good writing, and it allowed you to use the text and use words and use reading, but interpret it in your own way, um, th physically. And I felt like I could do that a lot better than writing or reading or you know whatever so it, it just felt a lot I it just felt a lot more comfortable for me I just felt a lot more comfortable doing it mm. and I mean your, your acting career has been been pretty good I mean I think you've had a film out either a short or a feature um every year since 2014 so you had the falling and brothers and uh, school Second, girl? school girls, Schools and girls. then Second Skin, yeah. Second, oh, I didn't know about Second Skin. So oh, you've right. quite quite a few films. Um, but how did you go from so you know they, these were kind of British shorts, I guess. Yeah. And, and one British feature. How did you go from that to a to a Tim Burton film? Um, I've just got to, I've just got to give that to my agent. <laughs> I guess she just put me in the right place, and I was lucky enough to have been liked by um, the casting director and than Tim. I mean, you treated the audition as um, practice. You, you thought, I'm not going to get it, but it would yeah. just be a good experience it, to be... This would be really good to just be seen by this woman. Like, this casting director is amazing. It, even to have said, like, I've auditioned for a Tim Burton film. Like, I was like, yeah, that, that's, that's really cool. That's, like, made my month, at least. That's <laughs> made that's made me really happy. And then she said that... Um, she was like, yeah, you're interesting. And I just thought, you know, that's, that's what they all say. Yeah. Because everybody says that to me. Like, you're call, just, call my people. We'll yeah, call yeah, 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 yeah. And then I didn't hear anything. So it was like typical. How typical. long was that? Seven months. Okay. So, <laughs> so you from April. It was... Completely forgotten about it, especially because it was my last year of sixth form. So I was doing my A-levels. I was completely military approach, revising 24 hours a day, like doing crazy stuff to keep myself awake so I could revise as much as I could or cram as much information in as possible so I didn't really have time to think about it which is ideal for actors because otherwise you just kind of like go over it and replay the scenario and like oh she didn't oh, it's that it was that that made me not get that part and um and and then I got an email saying Oh yeah, could you go to his house? Um, could you Tim go to Burton's Tim Burton? Could you go to Tim Burton's house? Like, could you just do that? And I was like, yes, I can do that. I will be there. That is fine. <laughs> I will put that in my diary. And I like cancelled everything for like four weeks, like surrounding it. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I did do it for like I just I did protect and cushion that day. I was like, this, this nothing is going to affect this day. Like this day is going to be perfect. 
And then I went there and it was just after Halloween. So it was like him in his prime element. <laughs> There's still like pumpkins everywhere. It was great. And then I was like, even if I don't get this part, I get to say that I've met him. I've been to his house. He's shaken my hand. He's looked me in the eye and he said my name. <laughs> and he said that he liked me enough to see me. Like, this, I'm like, I'm made for life. Like, this is great. This is great. I was on such a high. It's going to be your party story for a Yeah. Life. And then I didn't hear anything for a bit, as you do. And then I got, I got a missed call and I was thinking it could only be this thing because it was the only thing I'd really auditioned for over this period. And I was like, it could only ever be this thing. It's either another question about my height or, you know, some weird question that casting directors ask very specific like what is your height how long are your eyelashes <laughs> no, just <laughs> random stuff and she said yeah I've got some good news for you and I was like this could only this could only be this could only and then she said yes like well, they'd like to give you the part and I was like just just screamed and yippied and I danced for ages <laughs> ages and so I mean obviously you were related then at that point but was yeah. there a moment where you thought oh I'm in a Tim Burton film. Yeah, it was kind of like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Oh my God, oh my God, what am I going to do? I'm going to be on the screen. Like, they've made a mistake. And I just, uh, all these things. Like, what happens if I mess up? What happens if mm. I mess my lines up? What happens if I, I can't remember it? What happens if they, they decide last? What happens if they cut me? What happens if, like, I was, that's when the anxiety kicks in. <laughs> it's exact. it happens with all actors though. Was there, I mean, what was it like going on set? And what were the differences between the kind of more lower budget films that yeah. you've done and then this kind of like, full budget movie um well i think it well the first film i did was a was a feature film so everything and it was my first obviously my first film so everything that happened just blew me away we were staying like this amazing house and everybody was really nice and it was just it was just so much fun um and then i did a short film actually in between um that first film and the Tim Burton film. And that was very, very low budget, like equity minimum paid. And that's fine because that's partly how it goes, you know. Um, and I'd, I'd accepted that was going to happen when I assumed the role. But it meant that when I went to the Tim Burton set, it was very different. <laughs> and I remember just being completely wowed and starstruck with the scale of everything. And it was it blew me away every single day. Every single day I stepped onto set onto location it was just like have they outdone themselves again and as the days of the filming started getting closer because you said there was the elation and then there was the dawn yeah scene, um you know you said things like you went to try on clothes and yeah there was cartoon characters of you and mm. you know all of this stuff happening as you got towards the day of filming yeah i mean what was good was that we were we did trickle in a bit everyone was always really nice there but it's a really odd concept when you get yourself round. it's like people know who you are and you don't know them and you don't know that these people know who you are, which is kind of a bit freaky. So mm. I was a bit like, this is really weird. Like, why have you got a cartoon drawing of me? <laughs> like, that's really cool. <laughs> I really want to take that home because it's really cool. But I'm a bit freaked out as well. But yeah, it was such a nice environment that nothing felt too uncomfortable for too long. But I mean, things like, you know, being on set. Well, I mean, were you ever on set with Samuel L. Jackson? Yeah, no, I, mean, I had a scene with him. What, I mean, what's that like? Like just standing well, there and acting across from Everybody him. acted different when he came in because he's Samuel Jackson. <laughs> were you daunted or? Oh yeah, there were a few. A few of the first takes, I was like, um, <laughs> I'm saying this because I'm remembering something that Samuel Jackson said about. I think it was. Um, Dustin Hoffman and Dustin Hoffman had the same reaction that I'm about to say now so it was basically like my face was reading in the scene I'm acting with Samuel Jackson I'm acting with Samuel <laughs> Jackson and he was doing his bit and there was me just not reacting or processing at all what was happening I was just like this is you're standing in front of me like, this is really cool and Dustin Hoffman apparently I think it was Dustin Hoffman Samuel Jackson said that he was doing a scene with Dustin Hoffman and they, they said cut and the director came up to Dustin Hoffman and said, you do realise you just mouthed on your take, I'm acting with Samuel Jackson. <laughs> and that's Dustin Hoffman. So if Dustin Hoffman's going to say that, I think Lauren McCrosty is going to be a bit, a bit wowed. Did that come, become easier after a while though? Yeah, I think you'd, I just had to get accustomed mm. to um, what was happening and did you become kind of become chummy with him? 
I tried to. I tried to befriend him, but I think he just... And he said, hey, hot hands a couple of times. Because, you know, I like, set things light. So I was like, yeah, oh my God, like, that's my new name. Like, with nicknames, like, Sam, hey, Sam, hey, hot hands. Like, that could work. And a little... He, like, slapped my hand a couple of times. Cause, and then he was like, ow, that was hot. Because it was like, hot. Oh. So, yeah, that was cool. So I guess you could say we're best friends. Yeah, you could say that. And can you tell me a bit about the film? I mean, what's it all about? Um... It's called Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children. And it's basically about um, a group of peculiar children who um, are found by this boy who thinks he's everything but peculiar. He thinks he's the most ordinary boy and his name's Jake, who's played by Asa Butterfield. He stumbles upon this group of peculiar children and then um, something starts going wrong because they realise that these peculiar children are being hunted by the bad peculiars called Whites who is led by Samuel Jackson. Obviously, he's playing the baddie. (laughs) And they are after the peculiar children's eyes and want to kill them, basically. And Jake has to help them. And then, in the process, he realises that he, too, is peculiar. What's your character? Who do you play in the film? I play Olive in the film, who is a very friendly, bubbly um, girl who sets fire to things with what she touches. Whatever she touches sets alight which is a very destructive power, but she never abuses it. She only ever uses it for good. And she's in love, completely head over heels with Enoch, and she's not afraid of showing that, who is the complete opposite to her, who likes to bring dead creatures back alive. And, I, you know, we talked about you being on set, and being on, on a film set mm-hmm. is so different than most people think. It's, you know, there's lots of people around, you know, things that are meant to be rocks or made out of polystyrene and yeah. stuff like that so what's it actually like because again the British films you've been in I guess are quite gritty and most British films look quite realistic mm-hmm. but this must have been loads of green screen and special effects and you know there's a guy with no head and a girl with the mouth in the back of her head and stuff what's it like seeing that world created when it wasn't really there when you were filming well to be honest a lot of it was actually created for us so not that much was left to our imagination They only ever really used green screens. Um, They only used them for a few times, to be honest. A lot of it, that like the set was already created. The the house, which is this, I mean, it looks like it's CGI. Like being two meters away from it in Antwerp, I thought it was CGI. It was just this beautiful, out of this, completely otherworldly, completely unbelievable house. Um, which they'd managed to get for for, sh- um, for filming, which is just insane. I mean, it was just, even now, I can't even put into words how beautiful it is. I can't believe somebody owns that house. I can't believe that house exists. Um, and it, it was so easy then to, 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 to live in that world and to perform because it, it was real. But, but I guess even though it, it's real, when you're seeing it there, it's real life. And Tim Burton's worlds are very different. You know, mm. He's got a very peculiar star I guess yeah. um unique yeah. unique yeah what's that like though because it because it is very different like you look very different and the colors and mm-hmm. the music and the sound effects and the way that scenes are put together it must be really weird looking back at yourself like when we're watching a film yeah. we're seeing all of this we're, we're transported into another world and mm-hmm. there's all the people flying around and headless people and music and sound effects and color grading and stuff and you said you look at it and you go oh, I, I made a weird face yeah an act of views, a piece of work that they've done and they've worked on, it's really hard not to look at yourself constantly and not to think, okay, this is a bit where I'm going to come up. Okay, I'm about to come up now. Oh my God, why did I, oh my God. Wait, they cut that. Okay, no, they've moved that. That's um, because you're just looking for your performances because it's the first time you've seen it and it's the first time you've seen yourself in it. So apparently, once you get used to it, um, you you are able to see the the film as a whole picture. Yeah. And I, I managed to do that on my first film that I worked on because the first film I worked on was The Falling and the first time I saw that I was just looking at myself and I was just looking for when I was in it because it was my first film for one and I was just so nervous and I hadn't seen anything the director wouldn't look us look at, let us look at the monitors at all during the whole process. So I never knew what I looked like. And then when I watched it again I was able to see the whole film more Mm. as a collective piece rather than just the Lauren show Mm. but I know after speaking with other actors that other actors do that as well so it's it's not me being like some self-indulgent and the the film is about a bunch of kids that are slightly 
seen as odd by the by the rest of the world that can then thrive when they're put into the right kind of location mm. or environment which kind of mirrors dyslexia a bit yeah um what would do you think you have any advantages like dyslexia has advantages for you and it helps you to do things better than other people because you said that that was one of your things or mm. um you know what what do you think your dyslexic advantages are i think it's maybe the ability to take a piece of information and be able to imagine it and being able to interpret it in my own way dyslexia allows you to kind of have like this this almost separate way of communicating like um i have a dyslexic friend and we can understand each other on like this weird like psychological level like she's also really deep and and we get into very deep conversations very quickly and so it's it kind of allows us to get into really difficult conversations really tricky um and in intellectual conversations without feeling like we're stupid because we're going to say the wrong word or we're going to mess up or because we're going to stutter um yeah I, i think it I think I've become co- more confident after knowing that I am dyslexic because I now have a reasoning for the reason why or the reason how I process things and I approach information um which has made me a lot more comfortable with with doing what I mm. do and how I interpret and imagine information. So I mean what's next after this? I mean what do you hope for your career? Um acting is like my soul passion so i'd love to be able to continue to do it so hopefully something will come up after this um yeah it's it's a waiting game acting um and when's the film out the film is out on the 30th of september 30th, so yeah. the end of next month yeah so cool. 2016 so we can look forward to uh posters of you on buses and the yeah tube and well stuff my mum's like, like you're gonna be in a bus and i'm like mum seriously i'm not gonna be on a bus <laughs> i'm not going to be on a bus And you haven't seen much of the film yet, so no. you'll probably be seeing it when we do or a premiere or something. Yeah. Is there any scene that you're most looking forward to seeing? Because you did a lot of stunts and stuff for your character, yeah. didn't you? I'm so excited to see it all because... Is, is there it, any particular scene, though, that you just really want to see? I can't pinpoint it. Honestly, probably the opening scene because it's going to be the first scene and then I'll, I'll know that it's I'll have the whole film to watch. So, uh, I mean, how can people get hold of you if they want to cast you in more films or follow you on Twitter and stuff like that? Um, you can follow me on Twitter or Instagram. I'm at Lauren McCrae. L, I can't spell my name. <laughs> L A U R E N M C C R O S T I E. Laura McCrusty. Yeah. And all of, all of that information will be on the show notes page of the podcast. Um, so just only thing left to say, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. It's great having you on the show, and can't wait to see the film. Yeah, neither can I. <laughs> the Codpast is an audio production from Extraordinaire.tv. Once again, we've come to the end of another episode of the Codpast. And if you enjoyed this show, to make sure new shows are downloaded directly to your listening device, subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher or SoundCloud or join our mailing list, which you can do at thecodpast.org. And if you like this podcast, then you're going to love the rest of the podcasts, videos and articles, which you can also find at thecodpast.org. Now, we're always trying to make The Codpast the best podcast it can possibly be. So why not let us know what you think of the show in the comments? Or better still, leave us a five-star review on iTunes, which really helps the show's visibility. But that's it for me. Nothing else to say, but until next time, enlighten your right brain at thecodpast.org. Listener.